So, um, yeah, as he mentioned, I was doing most of this work while I was postdoc at Max Planck Institute, but I just recently accepted a position at um, IST Austria. So I'm getting ready to start there in January 2020. So if anyone is very excited about anything I present today, please keep me in mind because I'll be looking for some eager students and postdocs in the near future. So today I'm talking mostly about magnetic anisotropy and ricinium trichloride. And I think for this crowd, it's not really necessary for me to um, reintroduce the Kataev model, but just super briefly here. Um, the Kataev model is basically just a two-dimensional honeycomb system where you have Ising-like exchange interactions on each of the three nearest neighbor bonds of it. And I say Ising-like just because the Ising exchange interaction is pointing in mutually orthogonal directions for the three nearest neighbors on the links. And then for this model, the ground state solution is a spin liquid. So there's been a lot of interest recently in trying to find realizations of this model. And it's quite surprising actually for the complication of, of these anisotropy and the exchange interactions that we actually have some materials which sort of represent this model. So the two real key ingredients for finding this is large spin orbit coupling and edge shared octahedra. So if you have exchange which is mediated by either the chlorine or the oxygen on the corners of each of the octahedra, then you end up with these three exchange plaquettes, basically. And those exchange plaquettes are all orthogonal to each other. So if, for example, when you look at the octahedra, if one of these bonds, if, if the exchange is mediated, for example, through the top two atoms of that edge shared face, then there's two possibilities for which you can choose that the other exchange plaquettes lie on. So for example, they could be connected through those two edges or the other two edges. And it's just kind of a cute little property of undistorted octahedra that that's what allows you to have basically the same physics in all these different structures. So you have two-dimensional, but you can also have three-dimensional structures where you just choose one of the other options of these locally indistinguishable choices for how the octahedra connect to each other. And in either case, you still end up with mutually orthogonal exchange interactions on the three nearest neighbor bonds. So first question is, is it a spin liquid? And the answer is, well, no, it doesn't appear to be because at low temperatures, we end up with a transition to antiferromagnetic order. And it seems like in most materials, this is a generic phase diagram, but it's true for both the honeycomb iridates or ruthenium trichloride, the transition into that antiferromagnetic state seems to be at an energy scale which is much smaller than the apparent exchange interaction energy scale in the system. So that's one thing to point out. The second thing is that this antiferromagnetic phase is very anisotropic. So for example, if you apply magnetic fields in different directions in the crystal, then that antiferromagnetic phase extends, we think, up to probably 100 Tesla for some crystal field orientations. And neither of these things are part of Kataev's model. So, but anyway, <clears throat> there are reasons to study these materials nonetheless because they're showing a lot of interesting <coughs> physics in them. One of the first things we realized is from magnetic X-ray scattering, they show that there is actually broken spin rotational symmetry that corresponds to different crystallographic directions. So it says that we are seeing some degree of the type of Kataev-like exchange interactions that we're expecting in this material. And that's cool in its own right, because normally for the longest time, we've been looking to Heisenberg-like exchange interactions on Kagame or triangular lattices. And now this kind of opens up a whole new avenue of, we have this whole other degree of freedom to play with, our spin exchange. And so you can look to new materials, new lattices to try to create magnetic frustration and look for spin liquids elsewhere. And then as you look more into this material, this is from neutron scattering measurements. And what they find is basically not what you would expect from spin wave theory, which is that you have scattering, some sort of six-fold rotational scattering, but instead you have this bright red torch of scattering. They call it a continuum of excitations, and that's centered around the gamma point. Um, those are the type of excitations that you would expect from Majorana excitations in a Kataev spin liquid. And I just want to point out, very importantly, whoops, that those excitations seem to persist all the way up to 120 Kelvin, which is in line with maybe the Kataev coupling that's found from a lot of different techniques. 
Next is um, more recently, it's kind of become even more interesting because there have been thermal hall measurements. And in these thermal hall measurements, what they find is a small region in magnetic field between about seven and nine Tesla where the thermal hall signal is quantized. Um, so again, we should spend more time looking into these materials, but there's obviously a number of questions at this point that we should be asking ourselves. Um, one thing is that Kataev never really considered what happens in magnetic fields. So here we are with a system where the spin liquid isn't really actually where we expected it might be, but instead we're seeing a lot of interesting physics at higher magnetic fields. He never considered magnetic fields, what happens in very, very high magnetic fields. I think he considered the effect of weak perturbative magnetic fields. But then also it's very numerically challenging to look at models of the Kataev model in magnetic fields, also at finite temperatures. So we're sort of in the unknown a little bit here. And then you can tack on to that the additional questions of should this even be the starting point anyway, right? In real life, things are a lot more complicated. We know there are a lot of other factors coming into play like Heisenberg exchange interactions, further nearest neighbors. We know there's a finite G factor in isotropy, which a lot of the time isn't even discussed. And then on top of that, they're two-dimensional materials, so they have monoclinic distortions sometimes as well. So one further comment about real life is that the, the crystals are extremely difficult to work with. Um, they're very much like this pastry. And because of their weak Van der Waals coupling, basically if you try to pick them up or you move them around a little bit with even one fiber of a toothpick, they start to flake apart very much like a pastry. Um, apparently now they're starting to realize that you can anneal these crystals for several months and I think they're getting much more they're getting much better um, crystals that are much more th bigger along the C-axis of it. So we'll see if those actually um, make things easier. But for quite a while, it was difficult experimentally to uh, figure out what's going on. A lot of people were reporting several magnetic transitions and everything. And then we kind of found out that, okay, it seems like if you look to the smaller crystals where these um, these stacking faults are less of an issue in the smaller crystals than those multiple transitions that a lot of people saw uh, near the anti-ferromagnetic phase boundary seem to be not so much of an issue anymore. So um, the question is, I mean, I was working most of the time at Los, Los Alamos National Lab in pulse magnetic fields, and this is a system where obviously I think we're able to benefit from sticking this material in high magnetic fields. And I've spent a lot of time working on um, modifying and uh, increasing the applicability of different thermodynamic techniques, especially for pulse magnetic fields. So it was a real opportunity to um, try to see if we can learn something new about it, considering we don't really know what we're looking for when we say, what are the thermodynamic signatures of spin liquids? And, and yeah, what, what's that going to tell us? So what I did is basically, I wanted to measure magnetic torque and look at scaling, as uh, Stephen had suggested yesterday in his talk. Um, but there are a lot of issues. We've done this for lithium iridate at the beginning, and you run into a lot of issues doing magnetic torque in very high magnetic fields. One of the reasons is because um, normally what you do is you measure a bending amplitude in magnetic field, but that environment is quite harsh. So it's a very hostile environment when you get bursts of energy into the magnet, it's a lot of noise, and you couple to that in an amplitude measurement. So we set out just to try to make the technique a bit more um, sensitive so that we could properly do these measurements. The other issue is that those bending levers, they don't give you the same response, whether they bend up or bend down. So you start out with an asymmetrical response, you have a magnetoresistive contribution, um, all these factors were coming into play. So what we tried to do is just we said, okay, let's just measure it. Instead of measuring an amplitude, let's measure a frequency, a shift in frequency. And we, we do this every day with our quartz crystal watch uh, with the tuning fork on there and it's extremely precise. It oscillates at 32,768 times per second. And then there's a counter and it ticks and it gives us a second very accurately every day. So what we did is there is a company in uh, Japan, Akiyama, and they attach these uh, silicon cantilevers onto the end of the quartz tuning fork for usually for AFM measurements. And then we set the crystal on there and we vibrate that in magnetic field. So basically what happens is the quartz tuning fork is oscillating and that creates a vertical motion in the tip of this cantilever. 
And when you look at the resonant frequency of the cantilever, there's a very big mechanical motion that actually drives a small piezoelectric current in the quartz tuning fork, which is what we detect. So we're doing an impedance measurement. We watch the phase and then we set that to try to match and follow our resonant frequency with temperature and magnetic field with a PLL. And as you can see here, this is just a frequency scan. So for example, the resonant frequency is there. It's a very sharp resonant frequency. It's at 45 kilohertz, for example, with the silicon cantilever and the sample attached. So at first, like I said, like all things, um, we just decided that we wanted to make this technique more sensitive and more quantitative so that we could actually do some real analysis at high fields. We weren't really trusting what's happening in the high field limit where all the other systematic errors come into play. This is um, just the equation which is describing everything of, of our cantilever system. So on the far left over there, you have one half mv squared, basically. Um, delta theta is our position. So that's the kinetic energy of the cantilever. Next to that is the um, effective spring constant of the cantilever. That term is the potential energy, one half kx squared. And then you have two terms which come from the free energy of the sample in a magnetic field. So anytime you have some anisotropic material in magnetic field, you get these terms. This is dfd theta, delta theta on the right. That's your magnetic torque. And then to the left of that is d squared f, d theta squared, delta theta squared. And that one is the term, this is actually the thing that we're measuring now. So we're not measuring magnetic torque anymore. It turns out we're measuring the second derivative of the free energy with respect to the field orientation in the crystal. So this, People have done measurements similar to this, but this was the first time that we put together that, oh, that's a thermodynamic coefficient. So second derivatives of the free energy with respect to different variables like temperature. Um, so your, your quantities like heat capacity, magnetic susceptibility, elastic moduli, they're all second derivatives of free energy with respect to different variables. And what's cool about that is that they show discontinuities whenever you cross continuous phase boundaries. So, if I were to be honest right now, that's the real reason I said, oh, if it's a second derivative of the free energy, then let's measure just across an AFM phase boundary. And that's how we got into measuring ruthenium trichloride in this case. So the first thing to do is just at the, at the top here, just convince ourselves that we know what we're measuring. The top is just a conventional torque measurement. And this is with field aligned in the exact same direction, just to show you how drastically the difference is between these two measurement techniques. When you cross the phase boundary, Anytime you're in the low field state, you're in anti-ferromagnetically ordered state there, and your magnetization is proportional to your field strength, so your torque increase, increases quadratically with magnetic field. And then it peels away from that quadratic dependence, and that's, that's marking your, where you're coming out of the anti-ferromagnetic state. Down at the bottom here, you can see with our technique, you actually get a very big, sharp jump at the phase transition. So this technique is ideal for identifying magnetic phase transitions. Um, and I wanna mention just briefly that the size of this jump also depends very sensitively on, it, it depends on DTC D theta, which means it depends on the shape of the phase boundary itself. So that jump will actually change in size, that jump's magnitude will change in size depending upon where you are on the phase boundary. Okay? And then with it, you can see we're measuring very small single crystals. There are, most of them are around 10 nanograms. This one was a little bit bigger, 50 nanograms, I estimated. Um, so we rotate our crystal in magnetic field. We do a whole angle dependence at several different temperatures. And what you can see right away is that pretty much everywhere, we really only see one pretty sharp transition at the phase boundary. Again, its magnitude changes in size and at the high symmetry directions, because for example, if you're sitting here in the center at 90 degrees where you're most easily able to suppress anti-ferromagnetic order, 90 degrees is field applied in the honeycomb planes. Then you are basically, your DTC D theta there is going to zero, the size of your jump is going to zero. And that's exactly what we see. So these are the 90 degree curves here in the middle. The jump is very small in those curves. So what's the in-plane angle of field versus say A-axis and B-axis? So the in-plane angle for a lot, some of these measurements, we don't know. Um, for this particular measurement right here, we don't know. Um, 
at the at, at some point, what we did was we sent a crystal to get measurements done on it to try to figure out what it was oriented at. And then we tried to backtrack the phys that we did because roughly under the microscope, we're just by eye trying to uh, orient the crystal at an angle maybe 30 degrees from what we did the previous angle dependence at. But it was by eye, so yeah. And I don't know the particular direction. What but is, what is this angle data? I'm sorry? This, angle the, data, what is it? this, okay, so. When we have the vibrating cantilever, it, right, the, there's a quartz tuning fork, it's going like this. The vibrating cantilever sits on the end of it and it's, tr it's a vertical motion of that cantilever. Magnetic field's pointing this way and we try to align very well the vibration plane along with the rotation plane. So we rotate the entire setup in magnetic field. Mm -hmm. And that um, rotation angle is theta. So it's field relative to the plane? Yeah, f yeah, exactly. Field relative to, okay, so more precisely now, we use a generic kind of theta based on the probe, right? So like we turn something at the top of the probe that turns the entire rotation stage uh -huh. with respect to magnetic field. So we, we sort of try to set angle like that at the beginning. But then what we do is we look at the low field response, which you know very well, because everything at low field we understand because it's the linear response regime. So if I go to the, sorry, go to the next slide, one second. Now this has a. Uh. Why can't I go to the uh, replace transition close to 180 degrees? Uh... Um, you just don't have enough field strength to suppress it. Oh, okay. Yeah, so the anti ferming it's just harder to suppress the order when you apply field perpendicular to the honeycomb planes. Okay. So, sorry, let me backtrack one second. I hope I can answer your question. So first, if we just look in this low field limit because we're trying to understand everything, if I take each of those frequencies and I plot them as a function of the angle, then you get these black data points here. So this, this is a cos 2 theta dependence, which is exactly what you would expect because sine 2 theta is always the dependence of torque. And now we're measuring the angular derivative of torque. Okay, so torque in the, in the linear response regime is always going as sine 2 theta. Now we take the angular derivative of that, it's cos 2 theta. So we um, have in the back of our minds the way we oriented the sample on the cantilever, on the stage and everything. We do the rotation. And the angles usually check out. We're, we're usually off by five degrees when we come back and later compare with the cos 2 theta dependence. What temperatures So we did temperatures like 1.3 Kelvin. We did maybe 4 Kelvin, 7 Kelvin inside the ordered state so that we could map out the entire AFM phase. Um, and then we did a lot of higher temperatures because we were interested in the scaling behavior with magnetic field. So, um, yeah, we're usually with all the three minutes. Whoa. Oh, okay. We'll come. We'll talk later. Okay. So now we have a co well, like a well-established cos two theta dependence at very low magnetic fields. That's our seven and a half Tesla there. But if we increase magnetic field, we start slicing through the phase boundary, and we see all these different little jumps. So um, you'll see that every single time you come into the ordered state, you get a big jump down into the ordered state. But one of the things to point out is that this behavior around the C-axis, this is field perpendicular to the honeycomb planes, it becomes very asymmetric, okay? So you see that, what I mean by that is if you apply magnetic field a little bit to this side of the honeycomb plane, a little bit to this side, it's not the same. And that thing seems to become sharper in magnetic field. Second thing is we go up in temperature because it's possible that you get some weird asymmetric behavior from the fact that you have a broken symmetry state that you're looking at, right? But if we go up in temperature and we look at this asymmetry around the, the perpendicular to the honey complaint, you see that that actually sharpens again. It still exists and it's becoming sharper and sharper with magnetic field. So we can actually say something about that because you should see the same behavior on both sides of those if you have a mirror plane parallel to the honeycomb planes. But this is actually broken in this case. That's what it tells us. So if, you're, if your exchange were isotropic and you just had a honeycomb plane, that would be preserved and you would measure the same thing on both sides of the C-axis, but we don't. So we take this as some evidence that you actually have anisotropic exchange in this material at higher magnetic fields at higher temperatures. 
Then we can do a, a few other things, which is just measure in some different directions and make sure that we see the symmetries that we expect. So for example, we do an in-plane measurement and we see six-fold rotational symmetry. And that we expect because you have the three-fold symmetry of the lattice, but you also have the two-fold um, time reversal symmetry. And then finally, what we do is, um, this, this is just a schematic representation of something that preserves all the symmetries that we observe in our measurement. And it looks something like this. It has kind of a singularity on the, the north and south poles. That's when the magnetic field is lined along the C-axis. It has six-fold symmetry in the plane. It has the three-fold symmetry up from the lattice as you move away from the in-plane direction. But what we found is that when you change temperature, when you change magnetic field, it appears that this thing is the, the shape of this free energy. Because that's what you can think of is we're measuring the curvature of the free energy, but the curvature of the free energy has the same field and angle dependence as the free energy itself. So the shape of this thing is very robust with temperature and magnetic field. It doesn't change. So finally, last thing we do is just sit with magnetic field applied in the direction where you apply field in the honeycomb plane, what that does is it suppresses order the earliest in magnetic field. So it gives you a very big range of magnetic field where you can look at how things scale with temperature and magnetic field and see what happens in this very um, unconventional, partially polarized state at high fields, because that's really what we want to learn something about. So what happens whenever we go there is that your AFM transitions at the lowest field, it's at 10 Tesla, and then you can see this striking linear dependence, right? It doesn't do anything all the way up to the highest fields that we measure to. All of a sudden, as soon as you suppress antiferromagnetic order, the system doesn't care about any, it doesn't have any intrinsic energy scale that's setting any of the behavior that you see above that. What sets this behavior up here is just temperature and magnetic field. And this is exactly the type of behavior that you would expect from an independent gas of spins that just have G factor and isotropy. You would expect this exact same temperature field scaling behavior. So we can look to a system <laughs> that tells us something about what that actually means. Um, so if you think about the coupe rates, they actually show similar behavior in the coupe rates, in the strange metal state of the coupe rates. You can measure the magneto resistance, and it has very similar temperature magnetic field scaling there. And what that suggests is that you have very strong interactions in the strange metal state, and that drives the effective energy scale down to zero. So it's a result of strongly interacting, it's a characteristic of strongly interacting systems. So, in conclusion, what I want to say is that this very complicated angle dependence that we measured, which seems to have a spike in the angle dependence, and there are lots of other measurements which suggest that there's a very large exchange interaction, exchange coupling in this system of order of 100 Kelvin. Our angle dependence also suggests that there's susceptibility data of magnetization, and there's neutron scattering, and there's quantum chemistry estimates, and they all point to there being a very large J in the system. But what our measurements suggest in temperature and in magnetic field is that it's scale invariant. So where is that extremely large J? Now, this is the first time that we've seen this sort of scale invariant behavior in a spin system, but one of the things that it could possibly be is that Kataev has already identified what the low energy excitations of a spin of the Kataev model are. There are Majorana fermions and there are flux excitations. It could be that our data is suggesting once you apply very large magnetic fields, these things are interacting and it's driving the effective energy scale to zero. Maybe. <laughs> okay, and thank you. <laughs> It was.